She got her PhD from the University of Tennessee in 2012 in nuclear engineering um, and currently works at the Radio Chemical Engineering Development Center at Oak Ridge, where, as she just said, she is a reactor physicist <laughs> in a sea of radio chemists. Yeah. Um, so her primary research there is reactor-based production of isotopes that I get to play with, um, like uranium 229 berkelium 249 and Californium-252. And I love this fact that I found about you, that you are a self-proclaimed lifelong leader, which made me really happy. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hobel. get a chance to come to the university and tour any of the facilities here, so it's nice to get a chance uh, to get back out here. Um, like you just heard, I am not a chemist, I'm not a radio chemist, although I, I work with some of the best radio chemists uh, in the world, and I produce the materials that they get to play with. <laughs> so um, some of the feedback that I'm interested in from when I get to talk to the people who work with the materials we make is what materials are you looking for? What materials do you need? What sort of quantities? Radio chemical purities, enrichments, and that sort of thing. Because that sort of drives our research in terms of being able to produce those materials um, for you all to, to play with and producing them at a reasonable, as reasonable a cost uh, as we can. So we're always looking to better support the researchers who use our products. And the cheaper that we can make the materials, the more research can be done with them. So that's sort of the focus uh, of ours. Um, so like you heard, my background is in nuclear engineering. Um, I got my PhD in 2012. Um, I did my undergraduate. I'm from Canada, as you might have noticed with a few of my outs and outs. <laughs> uh, I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering in 2004, and I was fortunate enough to get a research uh, an internship at the Chalk River Nuclear Laboratories in uh, northeastern Ontario, and that's where I got my introduction in nuclear engineering, and I worked there for a few years before moving down to uh, Knoxville about a decade ago. Um, it's been a really interesting journey. It's been a fun opportunity to, I did a lot of my undergraduate, or sorry, not undergraduate, a lot of my graduate research with Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and then got a chance to work there after I finished. Um, and it's just uh, been a really great place for me to work, especially as I'm sort of the only reactor physicist uh, in amongst a great big group of radiochemists, so I get a chance to sort of get out of my uh, my comfort zone sometimes and uh, get new projects thrown my way, or I have to kind of go out and uh, I don't really have much of a a mentor or a team, so a lot of the time it's me trying to figure things out uh, by myself and uh, seek out that various experts that I need. Um, so I'm going to talk today about transplutonium production, which is a big focus of what I work on. Um, just talk a little bit about what we use transplutonium elements for, um, the history of the research and production of these elements, both at Oak Ridge and at other facilities, which is very uh, close to home here. You'll see your own name pop up. Um, and then what we do with these elements at, at ORNL, how we're producing them, and what sort of research we're working on in order to be able to produce them better so that you all can use them. <laughs> so what's transplutonium? Just looking at the isotopes that we're interested in. Of course, at anything heavier than plutonium-94. Um, so these are the different isotopes primarily um, that we produce or that people are interested in. Um, Americium-241 and 243. Um, then our isotopes of curium-244 and 248. Um, Berkelium, we produce a lot of that, usually every two years or so. Um, Californium-251 and 252 are bigger ones. And then Einsteinium and Fermium, there's lots of interest in those, but they are uh, quite difficult to produce. Basically, the higher up to the right uh, we get, the harder it is to make, and the less of it we make as a result. Um, but Californium-252 really is sort of the bread and butter of our isotope production program at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's mainly what our focus is on production. And then all the other isotopes, the Einsteinium, the Berkelium, um, the Fermium, they are just sort of co-produced along with Californium-252. So if we make any of those, it's sort of bonus goods. But Californium-252 is really what we focus on. Um, there is a huge international industry around Californium-252. It's only produced um, really two places in the world, um, at Oak Ridge and then at a facility 
um, in Russia. Um, I believe we still produce the majority of the supply internationally. It kind of goes back and forth depending on who's, uh, who's operating how many cycles per year. Um, but I believe we are still the uh, major source internationally. Um, so a little over two and a half year half-life and about 3% of the time uh, decays via spontaneous fission. So it ends up being a very powerful portable neutron source. Um, used a lot for neutron activation analysis, sort of online monitoring for mining, uh, mining industries, process monitoring, and then of course for, for national security, yeah, as a neutron source. Um, so we produce Californium and we don't distribute it directly to researchers. We work with sort of a consortium of commercial enterprises and we produce Californium for them and then they distribute amongst various different uh, interested users. Um, so Berkeley Energy 49, as I mentioned, we also produce this along with the Californium uh, 252 program. Uh, Berkeley primarily is used for the discovery of super heavy elements. Um, so Tennessee um, was one of the I think, four new elements that were named last year, to 2016 now, I'm not sure, within the last year or two, um, these elements were named. And so we were instrumental in, in that discovery. We produced the Brooklyn 249, and for one of the experiments, we also made the target. Another of the experiments, we just um, shipped the material out. Um, but it's deposited on these very thin films, which are then arranged in a disk, and it's spun around in a heavy ion beam and bombarded, um, and then in order to detect these uh, isotopes of these super heavy elements. Um, so we produce a lot of targets for that means. Um, Californium-251 um, is another uh, isotope that we do for this super heavy element program. Um, so while we don't produce the super heavy elements ourselves, our materials are, are what's needed for those programs. Um, and then Einsteinium 254 and Fermium 257, those are uh, isotopes that are going to be needed for super heavy element uh, discovery going forward. So they're looking for both heavier isotopes of elements that have already been discovered and then also uh, heavier elements. And so we'll need to produce uh, Californium 251 as well as these isotopes of Einsteinium and Fermium in order to further the periodic table and determine nuclides. So that's sort of the basics of what these different materials are used for the Californium, the Berkelium, and the heavier isotopes. So I'm just going to look here a little bit of the history of how these uh, elements were discovered, how they were produced in the sort of early days of the nuclear industry. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this guy with the with Seaborg. It's nice to be up here at Berkeley talking about, uh, about Glenn Seaborg. Um, so he was involved with the discovery of most of these uh, most of these elements back in the 40s and the 50s here um, using the linear accelerator and the, uh, and the cyclotron. Um, there were some additional discoveries that were observed um, looking at weapons testing where you have very rapid neutron capture in uranium and then by looking at the materials left over from that testing um, they were able to uh, identify what isotopes were generated in that sort of initial neutron burst. Um, but Glenn Seaborg was really instrumental in getting the, the heavy elements programs and actinides programs that established nationally, very instrumental at um, sort of communicating the need for uh, research reactors that were specifically focused on producing um, these heavy elements in the early years. Um, so things sort of started out at the Savannah River site, um, which is in uh, South Carolina. Um, and they built these five big reactors um, originally for, for weapons programs producing plutonium-239, plutonium-238, um, heavy water moderated, uh, very large reactors in the gigawatts of power. Um, they also had a very high target capacity, much larger than the reactor that we have at Oak Ridge or any of the currently operating uh, research reactors. They would take you know, tons of materials, fuels in the reactors. So here they produce 36 metric tons of plutonium. Um, over there, about three and a half decades uh, of operation. And they they are no longer operating. Unfortunately, it's a resource we don't have access to anymore. Um, but they operated as well as producing plutonium-238 and 239. They would run these special campaigns in order to produce some of the heavier isotopes, some of the heavier elements, using the plutonium that they'd already produced, then reforming that into targets and placing those in a special configuration where they had a very, very high neutron flux and could rapidly refuel that reactor in order to keep pushing higher and higher. Um, and over the course of about five years, 
Um, they re irradiated that, re that reactor grade plutonium um, to make plutonium 242 with only about an 8% production and efficiency. So, what I mean there is 8% of the material you started with would eventually turn into plutonium 242. So, you lose a lot of material along the way to fission. This is why it takes such a long time to make these heavier, heavier elements, as only about for California 252 production, only about 1% of the curium that we start with actually makes it to California 252 when everything else is lost to fission. So <laughs> it takes a lot to get started. You can just sort of see the scale here. It's a really crappy picture from a report that I think was in the mid-60s. But there's a little guy over here. So you can just sort of see the scale um, of how large this reactor uh, loading uh, floating powder was versus if you were looking at, uh, for example, the reactor we have at, at Oak Ridge, a high flux ice to a reactor, you know, would be the, you know, the, this big compared to this person. So much, much larger target capacity here at the Savannah River reactors. Um, so anyways, cycling again, then reduced again. It took that five kilograms of plutonium-242 that had been produced from the reactor-grade plutonium, process that into new targets, and a California production campaign was run um, in the 70s in order to produce, well, plutonium-244, mixed curium, and as well, californium-252. Um, now that plutonium-244 is highly valuable, um, plutonium-243 has a very, very short half-life, so in order to push past that decay, you need a very, very high neutron flux in order to produce uh, plutonium-244, and so it is uh, not very many places are able to produce it. Um, the U.S. has a very large supply of this isotope. We're not one of the very few countries that has access to any plutonium-244, and so it's a very valuable resource. Um, it has very long, very long, long half-life, so it's, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> and we still have that plutonium-244 at the Savannah River site. Um, but they were changing fuel at every four days, essentially, as they operated this reactor for the first uh, two years. Um, so <laughs> modeling that irradiation is, uh, is, is challenging as you have to go through and, and refuel your, your, uh, your model every four days for two years, so many time steps. <laughs> um, there were, I think, about 70 total targets that were irradiated um, during that decade in order to produce americium, curium, and then the higher, uh, higher level elements. Um, and this is sort of what they ended up with at the end of that, that decade. So, they started, and it was about 100%, uh, well, not quite, but close to 100% plutonium 242, and then less than 1% of that plutonium 242 was left at the end of the irradiation. And what it turned into was an even mix of curium 244 and 246 at 16%, barely any californium 252, um, but two thirds of it was lost to fission. So that just shows you sort of the efficiency uh, of this process. Um, and these are just what the targets look like. We have these very thin layers of, uh, I believe the plutonium 242 is in here in the center, and then we've got these rings of the, uh, of the fissionable material uh, on the inside in order to really push the flux and get the neutrons right uh, directly into the target. Um, whereas when we irradiate things at the high flux isotope reactor Oak Ridge, which I'll show you a little bit later in the presentation, um, it's more so we have all the targets in the center and then all the fuel is out here. So we don't have any fuel in the actual irradiation targets themselves, the way we irradiate things right now. So this was a very unique target design where you have that driver fuel right centered around each individual, each individual target. <coughs> so as I mentioned, the Savannah River site reactors are no longer operating. So we don't have this resource anymore. So all of the curium that we currently use for the heavy elements program at Oak Ridge National Lab all came from the Savannah River. We're still working with that material um, a few decades later. Um, and it really is the only curium um, that we have. <laughs> so that's very much a natural resource. And so as we start using this material and burdening it up in fission, making fission products and destroying this material as we make perforium, we start to think, well, what happens when we run out? Because <laughs> we don't have those Savannah River site reactors to make this material anymore. Um, and so we start thinking, could we do this again today with the resources that we have? So if we wanted to make that plutonium-242 again for our reactor grade plutonium, if we wanted to regenerate five kilograms of plutonium-242, it would take about 40 years of continuous irradiation in the reactor that we have at Oak Ridge. And it would cost about a quarter of a billion dollars. 
And then if we wanted to take that plutonium-242, that five kilograms, and turn that into the mixed curium of the same quality that we have now, that would pray require about another 50 years and another half a billion dollars. So let's just kind of round up. That's about a 50 billion, or sorry, about a one billion dollar program, and you know, close to 100 years. So the short answer, no, we can't do this again. So a large part of our research is making sure that we can use these curium materials um, as prudently as we can, because this is a national resource. The curium that currently exists and that we have access to, we assume that's all the curium that we're ever going to get. Um, and so we need to use it appropriately. Um, we don't want to waste any material to either to fission or process losses. So we're always trying to improve the efficiency of our program so that curium lasts for uh, as long as possible. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how we use this material at Oak Ridge um, and how we produce uh, these different elements. So here we go, this is the high flux isotope reactor. Um, you can see up here is what core that reactor is, so about the same size as a person versus looking at, uh, looking at the target loading pattern that we saw for the Savannah Riverside reactors, which were much, much larger. Um, this was designed in the 1960s um, by Dick Shepperton. Um, this was his master's project. <laughs> I always like to tell that when we're touring graduate students around the high flux isotope reactor. Um, so this is what you're going to do for your master's, right? You're going to design a brand new reactor that's going to be built in five years and uh, still be operating uh, 50 years later? <laughs> Probably not. Certainly my <laughs> master's project uh, was not that impressive. <laughs> Um, so like I said, this was constructed in less than five years. Industry today works a little bit differently than it did 50 years ago. Um, but it's, it's still operating and there are no plans to shut down this reactor anytime soon. I believe the pressure vessel is the life limiting component and the calculations and the studies that we've done on that say it should last until about uh, 2070. So this reactor should continue operating for, for the rest of my career at least. <laughs> um, so it really is, really is a workhorse. We do so much work with this reactor. Um, so this, this is just the core up here. So this uh, sort of central area here where we've got the fuel is um, in these two areas. And then in the center, we've got the target basket. So that's where we put all of our isotope production targets. So they really get the, the center of that flux trap. We get all the neutron flux. And then up here, we've got a brilliant reflector and various different target positions as well for experiments in the, in the reflector where you've got a more thermalized but much lower flux. So, um, yes, this uh, Dick Sheverton uh, remembers Alvin Weinberg, who was our laboratory director for a while, when he suggested the idea of this reactor, saying it was the most harebrained idea uh, I have ever heard. It really was a very new concept, the idea of a flux trap. Uh, style reactor when it was proposed, but uh, but it works. If you can see it in operation, we've got a lovely blue glow down here. <laughs> Google Hyper, those are the pictures that always pop up. Um, this is just showing you a little bit more detail. Um, so you can see cutaways showing the different, um, showing the, the, the two different fueled regions. Um, so again, we've got our, this is, this is blown up, the center region. We've got our target basket here. We've got 36 different uh, vertical sites where we can place isotope production targets or materials, experiments, or you know, maybe some material you want to radiate. And then we've got our fuel be up here, and then three different layers uh, of the layer where, other, uh, where other experiments can go. So the high flux isotope reactor is currently fueled with very highly enriched uranium. It's 93 weight percent um, E235. One of the, the few reactors that's still operating with that very highly enriched uranium. Um, there is a program underway looking at changing that to a lower enriched uranium. Um, many research reactors are switching from highly enriched uranium to lower enriched uranium for proliferation concerns. Um, so that's something that, that may happen in the future. They're still studying that. Um, but it does have the highest steady state uh, thermal neutron flux in the world, as far as, as, far as, far as we're aware. Um, so two and a half times 10 to the 15 neutrons per centimeter square per second thermal flux, and then a, a similar amount of, uh, of non-thermal. It has a very large um, flux as well, about 0.1 MeV, so is used a lot for material degradation studies as well. Um, radiating materials, looking for those fast neutrons. Um, operates about six or seven cycles per year, and each cycle is about, about 25 days, so almost a month. So sort of one month on, one month off, one month on, one month off is, is about how we operate um, the reactor there. 
Um, so the capacity would be about 200 to 300 grams of actinides. If we were to fill up all of these target positions um, with actinide materials for radiation, it would only be about 200 to 300 grams of actinides. So certainly a lot less than the five kilograms of plutonium-242 that could be irradiated in the Savannah River uh, site reactor. So just kind of showing you the difference in scale there between what we have to work with versus what they had to work with at, uh, at Savannah River. Um, we also have the Radiochemical Engineering Development Center, and that's where I work. Um, this is physically located right next to High Flux Isotope Reactor, so we have a lot of synergy there um, in terms of the reactor being right next to Radiochemical Laboratory. It's, uh, it's very handy. Um, and so we have a series of, I think there's seven um, shielded hot cells here in, um, in our facility, and each one is self-contained. We've got pass-through ports between the cells, so you can move you know, from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven but each cell is also contained so that you can minimize um, you know, your contamination of materials so that you don't have to clean one hot cell when you're done working. Um, we also have a number of club box and fume hole laboratories. Um, particularly, we're focused on working with alpha emitters, so we have a lot of labs capable of handling alpha emitters. Um, we do our target fabrication um, because our targets are fabricated from curium, and there's only curium 244 in there as well. All of our target fabrication, all of it happens with the hot cell facilities. Everything happens behind these shielded walls. Same with the target disassembly and all the chemical processing and then the actual fabrication of the California 252 sources. All of that is done remotely, which means it takes about 10 times longer than it would take to do it somewhere else. Um, and then we also store a number of legacy actinide materials um, in these facilities. So just looking at what a typical California production cycle would look like. Um, it's about a two-year process, so every two years we sort of restart the cycle over again um, and we recycle our material, the curing materials that we fabricate our targets from, radiate and process, we then recycle that to become the next batch of targets. Um, so we start with target fabrication where we convert our curing into an oxide, uh, we perform chemical uh, analytical chemistry on that material to get our exact, you know, our isotopic composition of that material. We press it into pellets. You can see down here, this is what a final pressed pellet looks like. It's about, it's about half an inch long, um, each of these pellets. And then they're loaded into this long stack here. About 35 of those pellets uh, overall are put into a tube. Um, and then it's got another, uh, this is sort of looking down the pellet stack. Um, and then it's got a little channel around it to uh, move the coolant along these targets because they get very, very, very hot. <laughs> And then overall, it's about a 20-inch active height, um, about 30 inches total length for the target. Um, and so this is the bundle inside of our, of our hot cells. Um, so that takes about three to six months. Um, and then we have a radiation, which takes anywhere from six months to a year, depending on the campaign goal, depending on how much California we're trying to produce, and also depending on when we need to have that, that product ready by. Um, and then our targets usually sit and decay for about three months after they finish a radiation. Um, and that's primarily due to the production <coughs> of ID-131 as a major fission product. It um, has very high uh, radiotoxicity, and so we're limited with how much we can actually bring into our facilities. So once the radiation is over, they sit at the reactor site in the pool and just let that ID decay for about three months before we ship them back over to our facilities, um, which are right next door. And then we, we rip these sleeves off, these aluminum, uh, cooling channels on the outside, we physically remove those and, and toss those away, but then everything else is dissolved all at once. We don't, we, we can't extract the pellets once they're in the target. Um, it's hydrostatically compressed and welded, so um, we dissolve the entire target, and then we separate it with aluminum, and then fission products, and then we start doing our elemental uh, separations. And now that's not my area of expertise, so I'm not gonna be uh, getting into that, but certainly if you have questions about those sort of processes, Feel free to contact me, email me, I'll, I'll hook you up with the right people to do that. <laughs> um, and then once we've got our Californian separated out, then that goes over to another facility, our Californian uh, purification facility, for fabrication into the individual Californian targets. And so that process takes about three to six months. So if you total these up, we end up with about a two-year cycle. And so we'll take the amory sum and carrier mixture that's left over at the end of this processing, and swoosh and it goes back into the target fabrication. And we do this about every two years. California 2D2 half-life again, but 2.6 years, so we usually need more by the time two years is up. 
Um, so this is just showing you some of the challenges we have in California production. Like I mentioned earlier, only about 1% of that material actually makes it through all of these fission losses if we're starting down here with the uh, carrier 244 or lighter isotopes of plutonium and aeracium. Um, we lose 99% of this material to fission. Um, so it's not a particularly efficient process, but in addition to fission destroying our material, which we don't like, it also makes all sorts of nasty things like the ID-131 that we don't want to bring into our facility. Um, and it produces a ton of heat. These, these targets are so, so hot. So looking at the fission rate of our target, um, that really is the limiting factor for how much material we can put into a target. Um, so we have to look at that heating rate and make sure that we're not going to melt our aluminum. The reactor uh, safety folks really don't want us to do that. <laughs> um, and it takes about 30 to 40 grams of our mixed curium of the, the curium that we have right now in order to produce 100 milligrams of Californium-252. And that's about how much we produce every two years. That's our approximate goal, 100 milligrams of Californium-252. And now that could go up and down depending on what the consortium needs. So, so more of the production challenges are that we have very much diminishing returns. Um, so these two lines here are, are showing our two um, primary carrium isotopes, the 244 and the 246. So during the irradiation, those are pretty much being destroyed at a linear rate. Um, and then the fission products so here on the orange line, so those are being produced at approximately a linear rate. But uh, California 252 is not. So it starts tapering off after just a few cycles and it eventually plateaus out here, you know, after about a year or so of radiation. So it's very much a balancing act if we're looking at efficiency, if we want to produce the most California 252 per unit of consumption of our material, then we want sort of a shorter radiation. But sometimes we don't have enough material and we have to push the radiation longer because we need to produce, you know, a certain amount, a certain amount to get the proper yield. I don't have the isotope weight percents on here either, but the weight percent of Californium-252 in the total Californium fraction uh, goes up with the irradiation. And some of our customers require a higher weight percent Californium-252 in their Californium product. So each year we have to sort of, or each two years, each campaign, we have to sort of do this balancing act of determining how long do we irradiate versus how many targets do we irradiate. Do we do a large number of targets for a short irradiation, or do we do a few targets for longer irradiation? So it's very much a balancing act there of total yield versus efficiency of producing that yield. Um, so our typical Berklim production, as I mentioned earlier, um, Berklim is sort of a byproduct of the Californium 252 campaign. We don't design our radiations for production of Berklim. It's just a bonus. Um, now, I, I say that although we have made a radiation specifically for the production of Berkeley um, 249 in the past. Berkeley 249 has a very different uh, yield curve um, from California 252 in that it, it peaks during that very first cycle. So the production curve for Berkeley 249 would plateau within about 20 days worth of radiation, and then it just sort of holds steady or even starts to drop by about 1% per radiation cycle. Um, so if you wanted to produce uh, Brooklyn, you would only irradiate it for one cycle, whereas we irradiate for California 252 for about six cycles. Um, and the reason why it peaks so early is because if you look here at this um, green cross-section curve, this is the production curve, production cross-section, the Cura 248 absorption cross-section. Um, so you can see it's much lower than this blue cross-section, which is the destruction cross-section for Berkeley 249. So you're producing it very slowly, but you're burning it up very quickly. So it doesn't take a lot of material until you've reached that production plateau where you're producing it and destroying it at equal rates. Um, but one of the things we see is that while the blue cross-section is always higher than the green cross-section, the difference is much greater here in the thermal region than it is out here in the epithermal region. So if you were having more of your neutron absorptions happening out here, you would be able to have a higher production plateau for that work 249 because your production rate would stay about the same, but your destruction rate would be much lower. So you're able to increase where that material plateaus. And that is actually some of the research that we're working on right now, is developing uh, neutron filters that will selectively absorb the thermal neutrons in the high flux isotope reactor and only allow pass-through of the epithermal neutrons so that more of the captures are happening out in that epithermal range. 
Um, and so what we see here is this is the production curve um, for Brooklyn 249. And so this is if just normal production, this low curve here. You can see it plateaus a little bit 10 days into the irradiation and then holds steady. Um, but then these three different curves are looking at different types of thermal filters. I uh, believe these are cadmium, gadolinium, and then one that's a mix of cadmium and, uh, and gadolinium. And so we're able to, to massively, by about three or four times, increase how much Berkeley 249 is produced simply by changing the neutron energy spectrum um, of the neutrons that are entering this target. And so this is our sort of conceptual design. We're planning on radiating this target later this year. We've got our, our carrium oxide target in here, and then we've got two layers of these cadmium and gadolinium filters. But then, of course, there's uh, a lot of challenges to this because uh, gadolinium has an incredibly low thermal conductivity. Um, and cadmium has an incredibly low melting temperature. So they're about two of the worst materials that you could put next to this incredibly hot target because you've got all this heat out here, and the gadolinium keeps it in, and then the cadmium melts. Uh, so it's been a, a, it's very much a materials and a, a thermal hydraulics challenge there. And we're going to figure out how to get the heat out of this target, since the gadolinium won't let it out, how to get the heat out of this target without melting our cadmium. So that's what a lot of the research is looking at right now. Um, so we end up with a lot of these sort of uh, effects that aren't so much uh, reactor physics, but end up being much more sort of practical implications. Uh, this is the ideal filter in order to produce Berkelium 249, but if you can't get that target approved and into the reactor, then it, it doesn't really matter if it's your ideal uh, theoretical filter. So sometimes we get these great ideas, but they aren't uh, practical in, in real life, so that's one of the challenges we're working on, working on right now. Uh, moving on, um, Einsteinium production. I know I talked to a couple people this morning who were, uh, I guess this afternoon, who were interested in Einsteinium. We also produced that during our California campaign. We produced maybe uh, microgram quantities, one to three micrograms, usually of uh, Einsteinium 254 every two years during our campaigns. Um, we co-produced Einsteinium 253 and Einsteinium 254, um, and the Einsteinium 253 has a much shorter half-life, so Usually it's, it's very, very hot and we'll let that decay and until they're about equal in activity. Um, but then, of course, we lose the Einsteinium 254 uh, along the way as well. So we're looking at doing the same thing for Einsteinium production as we're doing with Berkeley production, looking at the best energy ranges for those neutron captures to occur so that we can maximize how much Einsteinium 254 we make, especially how much Einsteinium 254 relative to Einsteinium 253 because if we can increase that ratio of the 254 to the 253, then it wouldn't be as hot, we wouldn't have to let it sit and decay as long, um, and so we would gain a lot of efficiency there. But this is the nuclear data curve. If any of you are familiar with the nuclear data cross-sections, these are not very good. <laughs> these are clearly, there's some one experimental data point, and someone's just kind of like, well, I'll drive this curve, that looks right, it fits through that one point. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty there. And so if we want to figure out what energy ranges should we have our neutron absorption occurring in, we need a better understanding of how these cross-sections behave. Not just here's a thermal cross-section and here's a total cross-section, but we need actual energy discrimination for that cross-section. Um, so that's something that we are hoping to get working on as well in the next year, looking at some of the cross-sections for these unsteinium isotopes. Um, uh, Einsteinium production as well, we would want to start with a Californium 252 target instead of from a curium target. And instead of just doing a filtered irradiation, we would need to do a staged irradiation. So this is sort of what the production curve would look like. We would uh, irradiate it in order to produce, uh, what should we say? this one's a Californium 253. So first we do irradiation to produce the Californium 253. Let that decay until the Californium 253 and the Einsteinium 253 are sort of in equilibrium. Then we would hit it with another blast of high flux in order to get that Einsteinium-253 uh, uh, quantity up again. And then, then we would irradiate it in that filter flux so that we could increase the number of absorptions in that Einsteinium-253 in order to, put it, to push it to Einsteinium-254. But we wouldn't have as many absorptions in the Einsteinium-254. And so this one here is the Einsteinium-254 curve. And so you can see as soon as you cut out that thermal flux, you stop having absorptions in the Einsteinium 254, and it goes up, 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 right here at the end. Um, but then we also have 
physical challenges to this sort of design. So if we want to have a high flux radiation followed by a low filtered flux radiation, we need to be able to physically strip that filter off between irradiation cycles. And so that's another uh, that's another concern. You know, it's another much more practical concern. So other challenges, as I've been talking about, besides physics, is uh, this is what we shift our californium targets uh, back to the rate of chemical engineering development center from the high flux ice shelf reactor, even though the buildings are physically right next to each other. This this cue ball is about oh, 15 feet in diameter, I think, and it gets loaded onto a giant flatbed truck and it gets moved, you know, from one building to, to the next <laughs> building. <laughs> so it takes all this effort, all that happens behind these shielded walls to make this is the Berkeley 249 that was uh, that was sent to Russia for the discovery of the Tennessee. So you can barely see it, but it took us years to produce it, uh, and, and all of this effort for this tiny amount. Um, and then also sometimes there can be multiple routes to the same goal, and that's especially true for Fermi 257 production. So you've got a splitting here between a metastable and a ground state. You've got a decay here to Fermi 255, but you can also push up to Einstein here 256, or you can also push all the way up here to Einstein 257. So you've got multiple branching routes. The nuclear data is usually pretty fuzzy when you get uh, heavier than, than curium. Um, so sometimes we're not even sure how we're making the product that we're making. Um, so there's a lot of analysis that goes into that. So in summary, um, the Transplutonium production program at Oak Ridge is very much focused around California 252, but that's not really the best way to make the trans-Californium elements, so the, the Einstein and the fermium, and as well the, the berkelium. Um, so if we want to produce more of those isotopes, what would we really need to be able to separate that production from California 252 production? Um, but there's a lot of practical concerns there, a lot of heat generation and our thermohydraulics really do end up being our limiting factors for what we can radiate because these materials are just so highly fissioning. And our nuclear data is incredibly poor once we get heavier, certainly once we get heavier than Californium. So a lot of experimentation really goes into this work before we can produce something. First we need to do years usually of irradiations to measure those cross sections before we can really get a production. Um, that's what I have. I want to uh, acknowledge the DOE Isotopes program, which funds most of our work, and UT Battelle, which manages Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, if they're related to the radiochemistry, I might not be able to answer them, but I can get back to you uh, by people who can answer them. <laughs> What is the uh, what is the actual spectrum of the hyper hyper reactor? I mean, sure. once you once you filtered out the photons. Yeah, it's um, it's very similar to a, to a light water reactor. Oh. Um, the I think it's the, the because of the beryllium. Epith reflection? Yeah, the epithermal to, to thermal or sorry, the thermal to, to epithermal ratio is around twenty um, oh. in the flux trap, uh, but it's about hundred out in the reflector, so it's very thermalized out in the reflector. Oh. Uh, but in the flux trap, it's it's similar to a light water reactor. When you showed the uh, picture of the actual putting together the targets for the mm -hmm. California rooms, and then like a slide before you had the you know 35 locations in the uh -huh. flux trap, is each one of those rods like one of the hexagons? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we could put up to 35 in there, but we usually we did four in the last uh, in the last campaign. And the the hyphen is pretty highly subscribed. Um, Usually, just about every target position is, is filled. Not necessarily the full axial height. Now, our targets range the full 20 inches of, of active height, but each target position is further separated into nine different axial regions. So one target, um, one experimental position could hold up to nine smaller axial height uh, targets. Some targets are you know, this tall and some are the full height. Um, and of course, the flux is much higher at the mid-plane than it is at, at the, the top of the bottom of those uh, experimental sites. So usually everybody wants the mid-plane. <laughs> so usually all 36 target positions at least have something in the mid-plane, but there might not be anything at the top and the bottom. And it's harder in the middle. Right? Yes, yes. Anything else? Is, uh, uh, oh, 
what's the refueling cycle? Do you refuel once every 25 yes. days as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, the, the fuel lasts for about 20, 25 days, sometimes it's 24, sometimes it's 26. If there's a very highly absorbing target in the reactor, then it'll reduce the fuel, uh, fuel length uh, of, the, uh, of the high flux isotope reactor, and they don't, they don't like that either. <laughs> um, the high flux isotope reactor, I, I didn't really do a talk about it here because it's not really related to the isotope production mission, but um, the, the, the HIFR uh, primarily actually, originally it was designed for isotope production, which is what's well, called the high flux isotope reactor. Um, but over the decades, its mission has really changed, and now it's primarily used for neutron scattering. So back, let's see, where's sure. Here we go. So it's got all these beam tubes. Um, and so there's a huge facility um, right outside the reactor. Um, and I, I think about 75 to 80% of their, their, their funding, their, their sponsors, is related now to the neutron scattering. So the, the in-core work is actually now a very small percentage of, of their actual uh, operating mission. Um, and so <clears throat> if we wanted to irradiate something in the reactor that would reduce their operating length from 25 to 24 days, that's one less day of neutron, uh, neutron scattering experiments that can happen. Um, and it's very highly subscribed. I think about only about 10% of the proposals that are submitted to Hyper to use their scattering facilities actually do they actually get any beam time. So they very much don't like it when we reduce their cycle length. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. There are any other questions? Please join me in being here. Okay. opportunities for internships at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I know they would, uh, they would be, be very mad at me if I didn't mention that. Uh, the NASA's <laughs> program is called, I think, the Nuclear Engineering, uh, Nuclear Engineering SLS. <laughs> but it's, it's generally the, the Nuclear Engineering Internship Program can run anywhere from eight weeks to, you know, much, much longer. It's very, very flexible. Um, it's open for, I believe, applications for next summer right now. Um, it's a great place to, to come and work for a couple months. Um, if you're interested, you can just Google any SLS and it'll, it'll pop up. <laughs> <laughs>